Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, another Morvin virtual presentation. And tonight we're excited because we're going to be talking about the Stocktons and the Civil War amendments. So as we as we head into Juneteenth, um, this is an actual you know wonderful wonderful way that we can commemorate it and we can better understand it through um, the world of the Stocktons at Morvin. And uh, tonight we have local historian and author John Baxter. Many of you may have seen him live and in person um, at Morvin and or at the Princeton High School for many years as a beloved teacher. Um, so tonight he's going to tell us about um, basically from the moment of independence in 1783, the United States struggled to live up to its declared creed of all men are all men are created equal. Um, 80 years later, the crisis of the 1860s was a tragic result of that struggle. So tonight, we're going to examine the roles of two Stocktons, Robert Field and John Potter, grandson and great-grandson of signer of the Declaration of Independence, Richard Stockton, uh, in the process of constitutional amendments to preserve and reconstruct the nation in the years surrounding the Civil War. So I would ask that you remain with your microphones off and your videos off, but your fingers can work the keyboards. And please, you know, when you see anything along the way, just type something in the chat and all questions will be answered. So welcome, John, and thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, and thank you for supporting Morvan Museum and Garden. And thank you to Morvan for supporting this talk. Um, it's a pleasure. I was thinking, you know, I was hoping when first talking about this talk with Debbie that perhaps we would be meeting at Morvan and doing it live in person. Uh, and I was remembering that the last time I gave a live in person talk was March 11th of last year, which I believe happened to be the day that Governor Murphy declared the lockdown. So I think I have the, uh, I hope I have the, uh, what, the pleasure of saying I, I gave the last live talk before the pandemic and um, the last giving, I think the last virtual one before it will be necessary uh, and the pandemic will be behind us. So um, I hope everyone had um, a, a successful 2020, made it through it and here we are. Uh, so. I am looking forward to talking about this, this topic. It's one I've been interested in. Uh, most of the work I've done in research has been about Richard Stockton, the signer. And I came across the story of uh, John Potter Stockton and his father, Commodore Stockton, with the Civil War. And I was very much drawn to it because if you do a lot of work with the uh, Declaration of Independence, which certainly I did with uh, thinking about Richard Stockton, um, you can't help but think about the Civil War because it really is the effort, ultimately, the effort to put into, um, into legislation uh, uh, so that the country would live by the ideals that are professed in the Declaration of Independence. I, I would say before we get started that uh, when I gave Debbie the description for the talk, um, I said that it was, this was about the struggle of the country to live up to its creed. And that may not have been the best way to phrase it because we have to remember back in this time period in the 1850s and 1860s, they didn't think about the Declaration of Independence the same way that we did. Um, yesterday, the uh, president, President Biden, referred to human rights as being in our DNA. And certainly uh, that's one way of expressing it. But just like uh, my gray hair was in my DNA. It took a while for it to actually come to fruition. Um, and the Civil War plays a big role in that. And certainly the Civil War Amendments is the first effort to codify um, that famous line from the Declaration of Independence um, that we all know by heart. So I, I just wanted to say that at the outset that we're, we're not looking to impose our thoughts um, on or our way of thinking upon uh, Commodore and uh, his son, John Potter Stockton. Um, with that, I think we're ready to begin. I, I would 
I'll say that I think today happens to be the fourth anniversary of my retirement um, from teaching. Uh, so I did not teach during the pandemic. Doing anything on Zoom is very alien to me. Um, I, I don't know where to look. If I look at the screen, I know I'm not looking at you. So if I look at the little green dot, maybe that's more appropriate. So forgive me as uh, I, 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 my eyes kind of struggle with where to be focusing. Uh, so the title of the talk, uh, Two Stocktons and the Civil War Amendments, let's break that down into its two parts. First, into the, into the chasm, I'll explain where that quote comes from and, and why I put it in here. Uh, but the um, first looking at the second part, the Civil War Amendments, what do we mean by that? And certainly the Civil War Amendments includes or is a, is a um, part of the Civil War Amendments are what's known as the Reconstruction Amendments, those that come as a result of the Civil War, but after the Civil War has essentially come to an end, starting with the abolition of slavery in the 13th Amendment, then the guarantee of citizenship and other guarantees in the 14th and finally suffrage for all males in the 15th Amendments. So we're gonna be talking about those amendments and that will be in the second part of the presentation with um, John Potter Stockton. But before that, my definition of the Civil War Amendments also includes those uh, that were not ratified, but were um, proposed and at least worked upon uh, in 1861 in an effort to avoid the war. So we go to the next slide. So those amendment efforts of 1861 will be part of our presentation as well. Um, the Peace Convention of 1861, where Commodore Stockton will play a, a prominent role, um, as well as in other events leading up to uh, the war in 1861. And the Corwin Amendment as well, that will come out of Congress and will be proposed as, um, again, a hopeful way of avoiding the war. So our Civil War and more Amendments breaks down into these two, the before, um, how can we possibly avoid the war? And then after the war is over, how do we reshape the nation um, as a result? And the first part being Robert Field Stockton Commodore, the father of John Potter, Potter Stockton, who will serve during the Reconstruction period. Um, both men, of course, descended from the uh, designer, Richard Stockton, uh, Commodore Stockton being his grandson, John Potter being his great grandson. And, and there we have those, that line that we all know by heart, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And again, this, uh, it, one thing that uh, I'll just say up front about the Declaration of Independence and that line, just to give some sense of the difference between how we think of the Declaration of Independence today and how the men did of the um, 18th and 19th, early 19th century. Uh, I expected as I was doing my research on the debates here, uh, I expected that the Declaration of Independence would play a very prominent role in the debates. And in fact, it did not. In the, the book of over 700 pages of the proceedings of the, um, the Peace Convention, uh, it wasn't mentioned. It's not, it doesn't appear in the index. It wasn't mentioned in any of those debates over the course of that convention. So, um, we turn to the crisis that begins the search for a solution. And that winter of 1860, 1861, known as the winter of secession, beginning of course with the election of Lincoln. Now, there was, you know, we could talk about the, the election of Lincoln and, and I should say upfront, if your recollection of the, the, this period of history um, in terms of and the things that came before regarding slavery and the compromises over slavery. Uh, I will be going into that somewhat, uh, not in too much depth uh, because we wanna not spend the whole night here. Um, but the election of Lincoln, certainly you know, we, we see that as the, the beginning of the crisis. Uh, he's elected only by the Northern states. Um, he isn't even on the ballot in much of the South. Uh, and the fear of the South being that Lincoln would be uh, an abolitionist and that he was opposed to slavery. Um, Lincoln doesn't take that position. The Republicans uh, in their convention 
their the platform they adopted was just an opposition to the expansion of slavery into the territories. But in any event, his election launches this concern that the South, some of the Southern states that had been threatening secession would now start to follow through. New Jersey uh, steps in and tries to solve this problem very early. On December 11th, there's a New Jersey state convention where Commodore Stockton will uh, play a prominent role that we'll be getting to. And then shortly thereafter, the states begin to secede. Between December 20th and February 1st, before the peace convention, seven states secede, uh, the deep south, um, extending from South Carolina all the way to Texas, seven states. Now I'll say now, and I'll, I'll reference it again later on, the, the Confederate States of America that will fight the Civil War were 11 states. So these seven states um, begin the secession movement. Uh, and it'll only be after the war begins that uh, Virginia, North Carolina, uh, Tennessee, and Arkansas will join the Confederacy. So when Virginia calls for a convention for proposing amendments, uh, I'm certain that Virginia would have sent an invitation to those seven states that had seceded, but none of, none of them will, will send commissioners to the convention. Uh, but they will be re represented by four states that ultimately will join them, um, Virginia leading the way. So Virginia on January 19th, um, after this crisis of secession has really started to move forward, calls this convention with the idea of proposing amendments to avoid this crisis becoming a civil war. And on February 4th, um, those states minus the seven convene in Washington, DC. Here's the election of 1860, the electoral map, and you can see New Jersey, um, the one Northern free state that does not give its, all of its electoral votes to Lincoln. Um, it divides its votes seven and five. It's 12 votes between Lincoln and the Northern Democrat candidate, uh, Stephen Douglas. And that's important. It's always important to look at the state when we start to look at the Stocktons as political actors. They're concerned not only about the national stage, but also their, their state. Um, so in 1860, and again, we'll see in 1864, um, New, New Jersey stands out in terms of not supporting Lincoln. So we go to this convention in Trenton um, on December uh, 11th. It was called as a convention of all men in favor of constitutional union measures. That's the, the quote, um, to consider the condition of national affairs and concert such measures as may be deemed advisable. And they put uh, Robert Field Stockton, Commodore Stockton in charge of the Committee on Resolutions. He delivers, it's just a, a one day convention. He delivers the five, there's just five resolutions, but the resolutions are really quite um, noteworthy. Uh, these two, the first two, the ones that had the, the most meat to them is that they blame the cause for the crisis on the North. Um, it's the interference of Northern agitators with the rights and property of the people of the 15 slave states. Uh, and it goes on saying, if this is going to be resolved, um, it's up to the North to remove all political agitation um, that was blocking, go back, um, and that was blocking the fugitive slave law. Uh, now that would have been the personal liberty laws that were passed in some states. New Jersey was not among the states that would pass those laws. Um, some states went so far as to nullify the fugitive slave law. Um, but New Jersey is saying here that she is in favor of supporting the law, following through with the law and um, calling upon the rest of the North to repeal those laws if they want to see peace. So the, the convention and, and Stockton's role is noteworthy because he, not only do the resolutions that come out 
uh, very friendly to the positions of the Southern states, but also this last resolve that there should be five delegates that would confer with the sister states. And those five would include Commodore Stockton um, and four other men who were like-minded uh, to Stockton who supported these resolutions. And those five men will end up um, among the nine that will go to, to uh, Washington DC for Virginia's uh, peace convention. So even though the, the General Assembly will add four other delegates to go to the peace convention, the five that come out of this initial convention um, will hold the majority and will be um, supportive of those resolutions that we just read, supportive of a, the views of the South. Now, to understand anybody in terms of their politics, um, it's important to look at what shaped them, made them who they are. And, and certainly, Commodore Stockton is a strong unionist. Um, his service in the Navy, he was just 19 years old when he was at the Battle of Fort McHenry towards the end of the War of 1812 and 1814. And the quote here is written by his um, Commodore, uh, Commodore John Rogers, who's writing here about Stockton's performance. And he writes, to masters mate Stockton my aid, I am greatly indebted for the zeal and promptitude with which he conveyed my orders, passing through the showers of shells and rockets. Uh, it is the Star Spangled Banner, right? Um, he was there, he lived it, he performed uh, valiantly there, um, and that would shape him to be the unionist that he would uh, clearly be during the peace efforts. The other event that will shape him is, and will have much to do with the, the peace efforts, is his marriage in 1823 to Harriet Maria Potter. Um, her father, John Potter, uh, we'll see in the, in the next slide. Um, he is from South Carolina. He is he's actually an Irish immigrant, um, came to the United States in the 1780s to Charleston, South Carolina. He's a self-made man through um, works as a merchant and as a banker. He will accumulate great wealth. Um, and in 1813, 1817, somewhere in that area, he will buy his first plantation, um, including over 300 slaves. So Richard Stock, uh, Robert Stockton, by marrying into the Potter family, has married into a very prominent, wealthy, slaveholding family of the South. Not uncommon, certainly not uncommon in New Jersey. So he has one foot in the South and another foot in New Jersey. Um, and that's important for understanding him not only with regard to his attitude towards the Northern uh, state's actions on the Federal Fugitive Slave Act, which we'll talk to in a second here, but also in terms of his um, racist attitudes or racial attitudes, I should say, uh, that he will um, have and uh, spoke about quite plainly in his speech introducing those resolutions in 1860. Um, he saw slavery as a problem. Um, it was not a problem of Americans. It was a problem of the British. They imposed slavery upon the colonies um, and it was just the way things were and part of the mysterious workings of God's will. He, that may be part of his beliefs, but the reality is that he becomes embroiled, his family becomes embroiled in one of the most controversial, at least contested um, cases of the Fugitive Slave Act. Uh, a slave of James Potter, that would be Stockton's brother-in-law, uh, Thomas Sims, is captured as a fugitive in Boston in 1851, uh, Massachusetts. Massachusetts has a personal liberty law. Um, they have laws uh, to try to block 
the execution of the uh, Federal Fugitive Slave Act to avoid the return, uh, to stop the return of Thomas Sims to Potter's Plantation in Georgia, but ultimately they're unsuccessful. So I think this experience of Stockton, having uh, James Potter, who by, uh, I believe it's uh, pretty clear uh, from uh, Stockton's biography, um, that he becomes quite close to his brother-in-law. Um, and this incident undoubtedly, again, shapes some of his feelings about um, who's to blame here. I think it was probably hard for him to put blame on, on his family member. I should also add, um, before we get to the peace convention, um, that Stockton in the 1830s is himself a plantation owner in Georgia. He begins a plantation uh, for sugar. Um, and I think by 1838, he has himself over a hundred slaves. So when he is um, going to these, uh, to this peace convention, he certainly can identify um, with the Southern plantation population, Southern plantation owner population. So he's among the nine commissioners that go to the peace convention in Washington, DC. Fighting Bob. Now Fighting Bob, part of that, um, that label comes from the fact that he was involved in, I believe at least three duels while he was in the, um, in the Navy. And we'll see if he starts a duel. The convention meets at the Willard Hotel. You can see the address there. There is still a Willard Hotel. Um, it's, bigger, more, it's gone through a number of renovations. I believe they've had numbers of fires in the 19th century, but in any event, it's still there at 1401 Pennsylvania Avenue. If you go to their website today, you'd see that they uh, advertise as being just steps away from the White House. And that's what the hotel really was famous for, access to power, access to the White House, and also access to Congress. Uh, the Peace Convention begins there um, on February 4th of 1861. And again, their purpose is to propose amendments. This is the lobby of the Willard Hotel. Uh, this is where a lot of government business got done, um, both among members of Congress, uh, as well as dignitaries who were visiting and people with special interests. And it's this lobby that turns the, the word lobby into a verb of lobbying and lobbyists. Um, so lobbying starts here at the Willard Hotel. On the same day, okay, and again, this is about the escalation that's taking place of this crisis. On the same day that they're convening the peace convention in Washington, DC, in Montgomery, Alabama, those seven states their representatives are meeting for their own constitutional convention. Okay. So we have this escalation going on and just a couple of weeks after this, Jefferson Davis, who walked out of the Senate, um, walked out of the Senate, I would imagine, in sometime in early December, um, when his state seceded, uh, maybe a little bit later. But in any event, he's now out of the Senate and will be named the president of the new Confederate States of America. Speaking of presidents, who's gonna preside over the Virginia Convention? Virginia named its own native son, former president John Tyler. John Tyler, he'll preside. Um, so he'll be there when Stockton comes into the room for New Jersey and they had a past. Uh, I don't know if the two men had met after 1844, but they certainly knew each other in 1844 when President Tyler was a passenger on the USS Princeton, uh, Commodore Stockton's baby in terms of a ship that was uh, propelled both by steam as well as by sail, by propeller, um, and also uh, carried two magnificent uh, cannons, one that was known as the Peacemaker, large cannon. Um, the peacemaker would explode um, when it was being demonstrated, um, killing at least one, uh, injuring many. Uh, Commodore Stockton, 
reportedly had his hair burned off. Um, but the two men met then. All that remains of the USS Princeton is the bell that hangs outside of Old Borough Hall here in Princeton. The other, so they, they named their the presiding officer for the convention and they also give the convention a starting point. They want them to con consider the Crittenden Compromise Amendments. Senator John Crittenden of Kentucky had already introduced in Congress um, some proposed amendments. First, he wanted to reinstate the compromise, Missouri Compromise line of 36 degrees, 30 minutes. Um, that was the line that was drawn all territories north of that line would be free, south would be at least potentially slave. Um, wanted also the guarantee that Congress not only did not have power over slavery within a state, but also would never be given any authority over slavery within a state. And all of those uh, agreements were to be codified into the Constitution uh, by constitutional amendment. And those amendments were to be irrevocable, not subject to future amendment. Sorry for the blurriness on this, but this is the Crittenden plan. You get an idea of that 3630 line. You can see it was the southern border of Missouri when Missouri came in as a state as part of this compromise. Maine came in as a free state. Missouri came in as a slave state, keeping a balance in the United States Senate. And since that time, you had the additional territories being added. Texas was annexed. You can see that line forms the northern boundary of Texas's um, panhandle. Uh, and uh, after that, you had the additional territories and California being added um, as a result of the treaty ending the Mexican-American War in 1848. And it's those territories um, indeed all the territories that are listed there where the Republican Party did not want to see the expansion of slavery. Back at the convention now, we have two men, two, two men who emerge as kind of spokesmen, um, kind of hardliners for the two sections. Morrill um, of Maine speaking largely for not just for the North, but specifically for the New England states and James Seddon of Virginia speaking for not only his state, but also the rest of the South, including those states that had already seceded. And these two men would get into a debate on a number of days throughout the convention, but on February 19th, they got into a particularly hot debate where Morrill um, was, really had had it with Virginia up to that point. Part of the, if we could go back just before we get into Stockton, part of what uh, Morrill uh, disagreed with was a statement by Virginia that she would oppose the incoming administration, the Lincoln administration, from enforcing law in the states that had claimed to secede. Now this is, you know, this is February 4th, but you have to remember that at that time, the presidential inauguration did not occur until March 4th. Lincoln was not yet president and Virginia was making it clear that they would not allow any federal officials or certainly not any army to pass through its territory to go down and enforce federal law in those seven seceded states. That would include the maintaining of um, federal holdings, inst uh, installations, military installations, and, and also things as simple as delivering the mail. Um, the Northern states and certainly the New England states saw this as an attempt by Virginia to kind of undo the election of 1860. They're trying to stop Lincoln from being the president of the United States as it was when he was elected. Morrill would close his remarks by saying that Virginia's position was a position of menace, that its mediation was going to be driven by threats. Um, so when he says this line, it is a position of menace. If we could go to the next slide. 
Stockton, Stockton, this comes from the transcript of the convention hearing, Stockton jumped to his feet and he said, if the gentleman from Maine wants to get up a, a, a row, a fight, we are ready for him. He shall have enough of it right here. I should like to know why he makes such charges against Virginia. They are unfounded. We do not wish to hear them. And then in the um, transcript, it says there was considerable confusion in the conference. And in the next slide, we have uh, a little bit more of an understanding is given to us by Stockton's biographer, uh, R. John Brockman. He said that he, his research showed that Stockton took issue um, and defended Virginia by shouting out in the assembly, silence, sir, and rushing towards Morrill with violent and angry gesticulations. We will not permit our Southern friends to be charged with bad faith. No black Republican shall. And then he's cut off when 20 or 30 Republicans surrounded Morrill to protect him from Stockton. And then a like number of Southerners surrounded the Commodore to protect him as well. The president, John Tyler, uh, intervened shouting out order, shame on the delegate who would dishonor this conference with violence. You almost get the sense that Fighting Bob wanted to challenge the Senator from Maine to a duel. Um, but peace is restored to the peace convention and they continue their deliberations for another week or so. And then they finally adopt their recommendations to Congress. And they're up if, if what Virginia and the Southern states were looking for were the Crittenden, Crittenden compromises, they certainly get a big chunk of that. Um, they recommend that the Missouri Compromise Line of 3630 be reinstated and extended through those Western territories. And also that ga they guarantee that Congress does not have and shall never have authority over slavery within the state and that this should all be put into constitutional amendments that would be irrevocable. So that is passed over to Congress on the 27th. Now, Congress hadn't just been sitting around doing nothing, of course. They knew, they were as well aware of the, well, they were, <laughs> they were very aware of the, of the crisis. And they had set up committees in both the House and the Senate to try to come up with um, a solution. Now, if we could go back to the, um, the previous slide, the first one of these recommendations is going to be a dead letter. Lincoln had already made it clear that he was not going to compromise when it came to the territories. The Republican Party stood for stopping the expansion of slavery. So there was no way that Congress was gonna be able to get that passed. Certainly not by the two thirds necessary to pass a, to propose a constitutional amendment. The second point though, the second point was one that this recommendation from the Peace Convention would give it, um, uh, kind of additional wind in its sail. Congress was already considering an amendment along these lines. Hearing from the peace convention that they agreed probably made it a little bit more palpable. So the Corwin Amendment, the next slide, says exactly that, right? There shall be no amendment where Congress is given the power to abolish or interfere within any state with the domestic institutions thereof, to make it even more clear, um, persons held to labor or service by the laws of said state, those being slaves. So the Corwin Amendment makes its way out of the House um, that February. Um, it gets stalled a little bit in the Senate. Here's a photo of the US Senate chamber taken from the gallery. And it's not until 5.20 AM the morning of March 4th, which is inauguration day, that the Senate passes the Corwin Amendment. So it can now be proposed to the states. Now there's a story that's never been verified by any document, but there is a story that Lincoln was in the gallery listening to this debate. He was certainly in Washington, DC. And if he was looking over this debate, he would have seen Breckinridge and Stephen Douglas, other men who opposed him in the election of 1860, debating this um, amendment. And he would have heard both sides and he would have come away um, certainly with a very good understanding of it. There's also some thought that Lincoln may have actually been the, um, the one to first float this idea 
of what becomes the Corwin Amendment. In any event, in the next slide, the amendment is therefore proposed while the gentleman there in the bottom right, James Buchanan, is still president of the United States. The fellow above him is, is the congressman from Ohio, uh, Tom Corwin, um, who drafted the language. Um, and you, it's hard to make it out there. The left-hand side there, you have the Corwin Amendment and you have the signature of James Buchanan there. Unusual, it's the only, not the only time, but it is the first time that a president will sign a proposed um, amendment. Uh, he, I would propose that he did it because he wanted to make it clear um, that it is from his administration or during his administration and that it has his support. Because again, he would have done that just in the waning hours of his administration. A few hours later, President Lincoln, and he's now been sworn in, he gives his first inaugural address and he's behind the Corwin Amendment. Um, he, I don't know if this was a little tongue in cheek, but he says, uh, I understand the proposed amendment to the constitution, which amendment, however, I have not seen has passed Congress. And he goes on to say that, look, this is nothing more than what I already believe that the federal government has no power to intervene uh, or interfere with the institution of slavery. Earlier on in his first inaugural, he said, um, I have no purpose directly or indirectly to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. And importantly, I believe I have no lawful right to do so, and I have no inclination to do so. So when he says that he already held that this provision was the implied constitutional law. Um, that's very true. He didn't think that Congress or the national government had any power, authority to interfere with slavery where it already existed. And importantly, at the end, he says, I have no objection to its being made express and irrevocable. So he's clearly coming down, backing this amendment that is now ready to be proposed. And it will fall upon his administration to now send it out to the states. And his Secretary of State, William Seward, um, would proceed to do so. I actually saw one of the uh, copies of the Corwin Amendment that was sent out, the one that was sent to Florida. So it's so. Lincoln ignores the fact that they claim to have seceded those seven states. He sends the Corwin Amendment to them as well. Um, and we do have a number of states that ratify, maybe as few as two. Some say there were really three. Some say it was as many as six. Kentucky is the only one that actually does so before uh, the firing upon Fort Sumter. But you have uh, Maryland, uh, but also Ohio, Rhode Island, Illinois, and West Virginia. Um, Ohio, Rhode Island, and Illinois, of course, being interesting because they are northern states, um, free states, Illinois, uh, Lincoln's home state. Uh, there is some controversy about their convention to ratify or the convention that I guess maybe did ratify um, the amendment that it was not authorized properly to do so. Therefore, the, the ratification had no uh, weight behind it. Uh, Ohio and Rhode Island would soon thereafter rescind. They did ratify it and they would rescind that ratification rather quickly. Um, West Virginia, they ratified it, but they were not yet a state. Um, so um, we we'll, can't really count them. But at least it, it does show that the Corwin Amendment was getting some consideration, was getting some traction. And if it had been ratified, that would have been what amendment to the Constitution? It would have been our 13th Amendment. So instead of having what we currently have as the amendment that abolishes slavery, 
we would have had an amendment that guaranteed slavery for as long as any state wanted to have it. But then the war came, as Lincoln said in the second inaugural, and the war came. And that will, that will put a, a stop to, there'll be some consideration of it after that, as we, we see, um, but it's clear that it's not going to end up getting um, three-fourths of the states in ratification. These two, there's two quotes here, this one from Lincoln, another one from Grant, that I think are, are good, that help to understand in this case, why Lincoln backed the Corwin Amendment. He said, I would like to, now he doesn't say this with regard to the Corwin Amendment, but it applies. It helps us to understand you know, why Lincoln was doing what he was doing. I would like to have God on my side, but I must have Kentucky. Kentucky was a border state. It was a slave state that had not seceded. It was important strategically, militarily. It's on the Ohio River. Um, he had to keep Kentucky in the Union. And he was successful in that, right? Kentucky ratified the Corwin Amendment um, and they would not secede from the Union. The other, this one comes from Grant, um, pointing, about, pointing out the importance of Fort Sumter as killing the Corwin Amendment. He said, the first gun that was fired at Fort Sumter sounded the death knell of slavery. They who fired it were the greatest practical abolitionists this nation has produced. And so the, Corwin Amendment, while maybe it was going to gain traction, and you could make an argument that it would have, would have gained traction, especially when the Civil War was not going particularly well for Lincoln in the North, that would, there would have been more consideration of ratification of the amendment. But because the war had started, um, there was no appetite for um, giving any concessions to the South in the, among those in the North. Um, and the war that would begin as a war against secession would evolve into a war to abolish slavery. This, um, in terms of New Jersey and the war, uh, New Jersey um, is going to become a little bit more blue than it was in, in 1860. 1863, they have a Democratic uh, governor, Joel Parker, who was absolutely infuriated by the, um, the initial uh, proposed uh, Emancipation Proclamation that came out in September of 1862. He opposed it. He accused Lincoln of promoting a race war by it. Um, the New Jersey legislature passed peace resolutions on March 18th, 1863. Again, this is the, the democratic view uh, that's being expressed by the majority, that party being against the war Certainly all of them were against the war for unconstitutional partisan purposes, which they saw to be the um, Emancipation Proclamation. They were against that as well. Um, the Democratic Party is splitting at this point where you had the so-called copperheads, those who were simply against the war for all these reasons, um, did not even want to see a war fought uh, to maintain the union, um, did not see that as being a proper or worth it. Um, the other Democrats, moderate Democrats, um, opposed the war for the reasons stated in this resolution uh, uh, in terms of fighting a war for emancipation. They were in favor of fighting the war against secession and maintaining the union. And into that bucket of Democrats would fall um, John Potter Stockton. And also his, certainly his brother, um, who I don't know if he was a, a Democrat, but he was the adjutant general of New Jersey, uh, Robert Field Stockton, son of Commodore Stockton, younger brother of John Potter Stockton. And he would serve with distinction during the Civil War um, he held that post well before and until after the Civil War. Um, New Jersey, although in 1863, they would be opposing the Emancipation Proclamation, um, by January, three years later, 1866, um, when the war is over, they would ratify the 13th Amendment. 
Here's the uh, map for 1864. You can see New Jersey is all blue there, giving its electoral votes to George McClellan, um, the general who was a kind of a thorn in Lincoln's side, um, who becomes a peace Democrat. Um, and uh, so New Jersey is, is deep, deep blue at that point. So we, we fast forward now, we're going from, you know, the efforts that were made to avoid the war, we're now deep into the war and then approaching the end of the war in 1865, March 15th, when John Potter Stockton is elected Senator from New Jersey. So he's gonna be going to the United States Senate um, at the beginning of what would become known as Reconstruction. Now his election is, is a little, well, it was controversial, uh, enough so that we'll see that he will be challenged to his seat. Uh, New Jersey had always elected its senators as well as other officers such as governor by a joint meeting of the legislature. There were in 1865, 81 total members of the legislature. When they met, um, the pre-existing rule was that you needed a majority, a majority of 41 um, in order to win the election for Senator. At that February 15th meeting, there was no candidate for the US Senate able to secure a majority that had to do with splits in the Democratic Party. Um, McClellan was perhaps uh, the other major candidate other than um, Stockton, at least initially. But they come back on March 15th, again in joint session, um, and they start off with a rule change. They change the rule that election requires only a plurality of legislators in order to win the election. And that rule change is passed by a majority, but the slimmest of majorities, just a 41 to 40 vote. John Potter Stockton just goes on then to win the election with 40 votes, meaning that 41 other New Jersey legislators voted for some other candidate. Um, that's the controversy. The controversy was when it's finally articulated in the Senate, um, the United States Senate, would be whether or not this joint session of the legislature had the authority to change the rule to plurality. Um, the law at the time, based upon the Constitution and acts of Congress, was that it was up to the legislature, the legis legislature, the entire legislature, to um, decide the manner in which the senator would be elected. So, a legis so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the controversy when we get to the to the debates that will follow. So Stockton, though, is um, he's certified. He gets his certification from the governor and he's ready to go to Washington, D.C. But there is this formal protest that will follow him. Now, because of the calendar of the of Congress, he doesn't go to uh, take his seat until December of 1865. So he's elected in March. He goes in December, December 4th. Um, his credentials are challenged by Republicans, uh, and that challenge is referred, as is typically the case, to a committee here, the Judiciary Committee, and Stockton is sworn in. So he's sworn in on December 4th, 1865. Now, much has changed, right? Much has changed since his election in March of, uh, of that year. The war is over. Grant is here, Lee surrendering to Grant at Appomattox Courthouse. So the war is over and Lincoln has been assassinated and both happening in April of um, 1865, just within a month of uh, Stockton's um, election. So when he goes in December, um, now the country is moving forward, Congress, Senate, they're moving into the reconstruction period and they have a new president. In the next slide, we see the new president, Andrew Johnson. 
what's the movie Andy from Tennessee? Yeah. Um, but Tennessee Andy, Johnson. Tennessee Johnson. Tennessee Johnson. Um, he is. Uh, he's a. You know, he was on the ticket with uh, Lincoln as his as his candidate for vice president on the National Union ticket. Um, he was from the South. He's from Tennessee, a slave state, a slave state that had seceded. But Johnson did not leave the Senate when Tennessee left, claimed to have leave, claimed to have left the Union. He was opposed. He did not believe in secession. And just in regarding the issue of secession, I should point out that at the peace convention, obviously the North wanted some condemnation, some even to put something into the Constitution saying the right of secession does not exist. And the South. The southern states that were present um, refused those resolutions. So we're about uh, um, two months into Stockton's uh, term as president, and we have the Judiciary Committee come back with its decision regarding his credentials. And it comes back in favor of Stockton holding his seat. He was duly elected. He was duly sworn. He's got an, a, a term of six years, commencing March 4th, 1865. Um, that's Senator Lyman Trumbull, who's the chair of the committee. And the committee was controlled by Republicans. So this was not a no small thing that you know, Stockton, a Democrat, was uh, supported by the committee. And Lyman, uh, Lyman Trumbull would be, if you can go to the next slide, he would pair up with um, Charles Sumner among the, the leadership of the radical Republicans. And it would be Lyman, uh, Lyman uh, Trumbull who would introduce two important pieces of legislation, the Freedmen's Bureau and civil rights legislation that were really at this point in December of um, 1865. In December of 1865, if we could just go, well, no, stay on this slide. Um, in December of 1865, uh, the 13th Amendment is ratified. It was proposed in January of 1865. You may remember if you saw the movie Lincoln, that, that Lincoln really held the election of 1864 as a, as a referendum on his Emancipation Proclamation. And when he was reelected, he goes forward rather uh, vigorously um, to get it passed and put into um, the Constitution. And he does that uh, all within 1865. So the, we now have the abolition of slavery and we have all of these freedmen. The question was, well, what does freedom mean for these people? Um, the Freedmen's Bureau was there to help with them um, gain some economic footing, certainly. And civil rights legislation was there to give them citizenship as well as protections of all United States citizens. So these were what would be considered enabling legislation of the 13th Amendment and very important to the radical Republicans. Sumner has a history. Um, he was elected, uh, he's a, he was elected the, from Massachusetts. He was the first abolitionist Senator uh, to take a seat and in 1856, this image here is of his caning by Representative uh, Brooks from South Carolina. Um, Sumner had delivered a speech uh, on what was taking place in Kansas. You can see that in his hand there, his speech on Kansas, that uh, the Southern gentleman from uh, the House of Representatives saw to be a, uh, an insult of his cousin who was Senator Brooks from South Carolina. And he came in and he, while Sumner was signing correspondence after a uh, session of the Senate, uh, Brooks would wait for the women to leave the gallery and then he would commence to start beating Sumner with his cane. Important that it was a caning. He didn't challenge him to a duel. Um, Southern chivalry uh, would have been inappropriate to uh, challenge him to a duel, Brooks considering Sumner to be an inferior. He didn't um, challenge inferiors to a duel. 
you beat them or whip them. So we have that taking place. Some that was gravely injured, uh, but does this obviously recover. So Stockton, while he's in his seat, after you know the, the committee has supported him, he's voting no uh, consistently against the enabling legislation, the Freedmen Bureau, Freedmen's Bureau Act and the Civil Rights Act. He's voting against the acts themselves. He's voting against efforts to amend them to make them stronger. Um, the legislation passes regardless. Uh, the Republicans didn't need his vote, but he is not making himself a friend of Charles Sumner. Then a surprise happens. February 19th, 1866, President Johnson ex exercises his power of the veto and vetoes the Freedmen's Bureau legislation, which creates a crisis for the radical Republicans. And this is where Sumner, or Stockton rather, really meets Sumner um, as an adversary. Um, I've changed the, the image of John Stockton there. He's obviously a little bit older, just based upon his mustache, which is remarkable. Um, it's, uh, but that's probably how he appeared just about this time in 1866. Um, and now he's gonna go up against the radical Republicans. There's the movement to remove Stockton. March 22nd, the Judiciary Committee report is finally brought up on the floor of the Senate for a vote. The Repub Republicans immediately seek to amend the resolution rather than it being resolved that Stockton was duly elected and is entitled to his seat. The resolution should read not duly elected, not entitled to his seat. So the Republican party is going against a committee report that came out of a Republican majority committee. This starts on March 22nd, when this occurs, this starts a debate that will go on um, for a week, on and off, but would take up uh, a considerable amount of Senate time. And Stockton would prove himself to be a very um, worthy adversary for, Sum for Sumner, but he starts off in his first um, address on this issue. He's addressing the rest of the Senate body Early on, he says, it is a very unpleasant thing to have anyone believe that a gentleman would claim a seat to which he was not clearly entitled. A very unpleasant thing. And I include this quote because I think, you know, when I first read it, I thought it really spoke to who, where, who Stockton was as an individual um, and what he is now going to be going through in this next week as he's being challenged, not only a challenge to his seat, but also he sees it as a challenge to him being a gentleman, that he could possibly have taken his seat under false pretenses. So the debate begins. But why the seven week delay, right? You had the report on the 30th, it doesn't come up until the 22nd, it's a Republican report, March 22nd. And the answer to that is, is Johnson's veto. February 19th, the, the very next day, um, the Republicans attempt to override that veto, but lack the votes. And then on March 13th, they passed that second piece of legislation that's so important to them, the Civil Rights Act. And now they have to be concerned, well, will Johnson veto that act as well? So they turn to Stockton and the idea of removing Stockton. But it's not going to be easy. Um, it is derailed. Um, this would be on March 23rd, after more than a, a day of debate. So it's towards the end of their session on the 23rd. The resolution is brought to a vote. The secretary calls the roll, just going through all the senators. Um, by an alphabetical order, Yates being the last one. After calling Yates, you can imagine the Senate leaders 
and Stockton, uh, keeping track of the vote as it goes along. At that point, the vote stood 21 to 20 in Stockton's favor. And at that moment, a senator calls out, vote. And when he does, another stand senator stands up and shouts, call my name. And his name is called and he votes nay, tying the vote at 21 to 21. So who were these men that were calling out? Next slide. It was Sumner, Senator from Massachusetts who called out to someone to vote. He knew who he was calling to. He was calling to our friend from Maine, Lot Morell, um, who then stood up and said, call my name. He had not voted up to that point, We'll talk about why later, um, but it was Senator Morrill who, and, and you know, you know, I, I certainly would hope that he wasn't doing this um, in terms of voting against Stockton because of his uh, previous experience with the Stockton family, but it does, uh, it is a, a coincidence that it's the same individual. So, you know, Morrill has become, Morrell has become a, a radical Republican. Uh, the fellow who was his adversary from Virginia in the Peace Convention, James Seddon, um, he went on to become Secretary of War for the Confederacy. So those two men who were battling it out in the Peace Convention um, certainly took very opposite sides in the struggle. So the effort to remove, well, now it's at a tie vote, but then another Senator stands up and shouts, call my name. After uh, Morrell has tied it, uh, he votes yay, breaking the tie in Stockton's favor, 22 to 21. And that was John Stockton. John Potter Stockton had not voted up to that point, but when he heard Morrill, Morrill rather, vote, he stands up and he pushes it over the line in his favor, showing Charles Sumner that he's got a worthy adversary here. Now, if we look at why, uh, why didn't uh, Morrill vote? Why hadn't Stockton voted? We'll talk about Stockton in a moment. But what happened was Morrill had paired with William Wright of New Jersey. And pairing was this informal uh, procedure where if a Senator was going to be absent, and not able to vote, it wasn't. It wasn't. It was fairly common um, for that senator to seek out a senator on the opposite side of an issue, whether it be a bill or a resolution, and ask that senator to senator to agree not to vote. So they would kind of wash each other out. The senator, in this case, who was going to be absent, being William Wright, paired with and asked uh, Morrill to pair, pair with him back around January 30th when the report was first introduced, um, Morrill had agreed. So when the vote came up on March 20, I'm sorry, yeah, March 23rd, um, it had been about probably seven weeks since they had paired. Morrill would claim, well, seven weeks was just too long. So I had kind of made up my mind that I would vote if it was needed. So he does vote when Sumner calls on him to vote, um, but it was a violation of the pairing. When that violation of the pairing took place, which Stockton was certainly aware of, he stands up feeling that he is now entitled to vote, um, even though he has a strong self-interest in the, in the matter. So Sumner, you can imagine Sumner, <laughs> um, after experiencing this on a Friday, how Stockton has now voted and how in the world is he gonna get this removal back on track? He comes, comes in on Monday very well prepared. Um, if you were to read his speech that he delivers, um, it is full of citations and um, authorities uh, for um, Stockton not being allowed to vote. So he, act, he starts by moving to amend the journal by striking out the vote of Stockton. Just amend the, the um, change the vote in the journal 
just take out Stockton's name as having voted um, and uh, at least put it back as a, as a tie. The problem was that there was no rule against Stockton voting. And in fact, he did vote. So even members of, um, of Sumner's own party would object to this saying, you can't change the journal when it's an actual reflection of what in fact happened. Another Senator then moves to reconsider the vote. If they reconsider the vote, they can then before they vote block Stockton from voting. But reconsideration could only occur if the resolution had passed. You could only reconsider a vote on a pass resolution. And you had to be among the majority that had voted to pass it in order to request the reconsideration. Of course, this resolution only passed with a majority of one, and that majority of one was John Potter Stockton. So the Republicans kind of start to tie themselves up into knots here for a little bit, and there's going to be two more days of debate. All of the 26th and the 27th, um, this debate goes on. And Senator Wright was, was quite ill. Um, and he, he had been quite ill periodically, I think uh, for at least a couple of years before this occurred. So when Morrill, Morrill says that um, he didn't expect the pairing to last seven weeks, well, if ever there was a Senator in the United States Senate during the 39th Congress um, that would need a pairing for more than seven weeks, it would be Senator Wright. And he telegraphed on the 27th, the day that it, there was expected to be the vote, that he could be present on the 29th. Wright is up in Newark. Um, they're even in the debates, they're talking about how many trains there are and how long the trains take to get to Washington, DC. They decided it would take eight hours for him to get there. But he says, I can't, I'm still too weak to or sick to travel, but I can be there, I believe, by the 29th. And he asks that someone bring a motion to postpone, which they did postpone the vote for just those two days. And that vote fails. I don't know that Senator Wright ever returned to Washington, DC, but he does die later that year, November 1st. So the vote's gonna go forward on the 27th. And initially the vote is 21 for, 22 against Stockton. A senator then changed his vote. Having been for Stockton, he changes it to against Stockton, now making it 23 to 20. Stockton did not vote. In the course of all the debate, it was resolved that someone with uh, that self-interest should not vote. Wright, of course, was absent. Initially, I thought that uh, Morrill did vote because he had argued that he was no longer paired with Wright. So there wouldn't have been anything to keep him from voting if Wright was absent. But in fact, Morrill ends up being absent himself and not only absent, but paired with another Senator. So he takes another, another vote away from Stockton um, as a result of that, using the pairing now in the opposite way. Um, Stockton's seat is declared vacant, um, and actually it's declared vacant, essentially going back to uh, March 4th of 1865, that he was never properly entitled to the vote. We can talk more if you're interested about the, the debate that goes on those two days. I would say that um, it consumed about 50 pages of the Congressional Globe, which maybe I'll show it uh, my hands on it is a lot of uh, is is a lot of debate, um, but it does take up a lot of the Senate's time, and there's a reason for it. Um, historian Eric Foner, perhaps our most distinguished historian in terms of the Reconstruction period and American history in general, but certainly with Reconstruction, he wrote this, underscoring the intensity of Republican feeling during this period of this issue of presidential vetoes and these important pieces of legislation, the Senate expelled Democratic Senator John P. Stockton before the vote on repassage, that is the vote to override uh, 
Johnson's veto of the Civil Rights Act. And they did so on questionable grounds. The next slide gives us the view of a New Jersey historian, William Gillette, uh, from his book on uh, Civil War politics during this period, leading up to and during the Civil War called Jersey Blue. With Johnson's vetoes, the issue of with Johnson's vetoes, the issue of Stockton's credentials took on national importance. Realizing they needed to expel one Democratic senator, Republicans conveniently found Stockton's election irregular and ousted him. Excellent. And, and Johnson did, as Sumner feared, he did veto the Civil Rights Act. It's actually his, his veto message is actually placed on the record immediately following uh, the vote to ouster Stockton. Uh, but on April 9th, without Stockton there, uh, they are able to override the president's veto for the first time in United States history. Republicans then start considering how to put the civil rights legislation actually into the constitution. So it would be beyond shifting political majorities and a presidential veto should more legislation be necessary. And then on June 13th, they do that by proposing the 14th Amendment, which um, Sumner initially blocked himself. The 14th Amendment, um, arguably, and I would say, I believe the most important amendment, not just of the Civil War amendments, but perhaps of all the amendments, at least post Bill of Rights, that all persons born within the United States are citizens thereof, that um, would override the Dred Scott decision. So freed, freedmen, former slaves are now citizens of the United States. Equal protection of the laws is guaranteed and no state, no state shall deprive a person of life, liberty or property without due process. Um, that squarely puts the states now under the national constitution and the protections guaranteed by our uh, national constitution. And also the three-fifths compromise is repealed by the 14th Amendment. It goes out to the states. It's quickly ratified by the state of New Jersey on September 11th, 1866. The New Jersey, and again, this is about those the shifting political majorities. The New Jersey legislature then withdraws its ratification, also in 1868. The governor then vetoes the withdrawal of the ratification. The legislature then overrides his veto of their withdrawal. So it's left that it had been withdrawn, their ratification. Um, the amendment is nevertheless pronounced ratified by three fourths of the states, including New Jersey. Um, Secretary of State Seward chooses just to ignore New Jersey's actions. Uh, many people believe then and probably still believe that um, withdrawal of ratification is questionable at least in terms of um, it being constitutional, but um, it's ratified. And then in 2003, um, the New Jersey legislature revoked the withdrawal of ratification, making it clear that New Jersey's ratification um, or making clear its ratification of the 14th Amendment. What happens after his removal in terms of Stockton's own personal career? He does bring about a change in the election of senators. Congress realizes it needs, needs to make things a little bit tidier. Uh, they pass an act to regulate the times and manner of holding elections uh, for senators um, in Congress was passed. Um, that required that if it's a bicameral legislature, that each, legis each house separately elect a candidate with a majority vote. And if it happens to be the same as elected in the other house, that person is duly elected. And in January of 1869, the New Jersey legislature follows that manner of election and duly elects John Potter Stockton to the United States Senate. He returns to the Senate. Um, the 15th Amendment has already passed the Senate. Um, 
just weeks before Senate takes it or Stockton takes his seat. So he's not going to be embroiled in any further um, controversy um, regarding these Civil War amendments. He uh, serves his full six year term um, and goes on to serve as Attorney General of New Jersey for 20 years from 1877 to 1896. By all accounts, he was an outstanding attorney and outs uh, an outstanding attorney general as well. Um, very well spoken. Certainly was able to make a convincing argument as he proved throughout these debates. The end. Happy Juneteenth. Our 12th federal um, election just passed by Congress um, and soon to be signed, I would imagine, if, well, perhaps even signed today by uh, President Biden. That'll be Saturday. Thank you. That's all I have. And I do. Thank you, Thank you John. I, um, I have just to check the chat right now because I couldn't see it, but um, someone is asking, how long did you do the research for this lecture? <laughs> well, <laughs> My, my interest in the Stocktons um, goes back to when I, I, I came to Princeton uh, to teach at Princeton High School and was taken on the, uh, the tour that is given to all new teachers coming to the high school or to the district rather. Um, and it was led by this wonderful teacher, Connie Escher, who pointed out all the sites of uh, Princeton as we were taken around in a large, uh, comfortable bus. And I remember going past Morvin, um, remember hearing a little bit about Richard Stockton and just ever from that time on, um, I have been researching the Stocktons. Um, as far as focusing in on this issue, uh, really just since in talking with Debbie and, and proposing this as a uh, possible talk, um, you know, the last few months really concentrating in a narrow fas fashion, uh, reading those 50 pages of the uh, Congressional Globe, uh, going through all the records. I, I'll say this, um, I do regret uh, that I hadn't been researching this particular topic longer with the same seriousness that I have for the past uh, couple of months, because um, there's a lot more out there. There has to be. Um, in the papers of John Potter Stockton, in the papers of the other senators involved in this, their personal letters, there has to be more to the story. I love that one quote from John Potter Stockton in the debate, but I'm sure that there are documents, personal letters, journals, whatever it may be, that would be um, rich with that type of material. And that to me is what makes these stories really come alive. What I've given you, is really you know, what's available you know, online um, through the Library of Congress uh, website. Um, but I feel that um, it's kind of skimming, skimming the surface. And I think it's a very interesting um, topic that needs further perusal. So maybe in a couple of years, I'll come back. Well, John Potter Stockton is um, one of those um, Morbin stories that isn't often told, you know, he's kind of in the shadow of his father. Um, you know, we talk about the Commodore a lot more than we talk about him. Um, so this was great to have, you know, this come to light. Uh, I'm looking to see if there are other questions. If anyone has any other questions, please feel free to type them into the chat. I know we covered so much tonight. I apologize for going over. I didn't, I should have had a a stopwatch in front of me. Um, should, have, should have realized. Well, uh, no, this is great. And and uh, again, a lot of people, you know, now that Juneteenth has been named a federal holiday, um, you know, people think they know the backstory behind some of the amendments that, you know, made this all possible. But now we have more detail on how they came to be. So. Yeah, I, I think, you know, in thinking about the Commodore's role, you know, he, he certainly um, directed uh, the uh, Peace Convention in the direction that they ultimately arrive with the resolutions 
that take us to the Corwin Amendment, which I think is so um, worth pondering. What, what the future? What if? What if that What if that amendment can actually become our Thirteenth Amendment? Um, and that struggle, and then John Potter Stockton's struggle. He actually, uh, um, it's in a way, it's because of him uh, that we get the Fourteenth Amendment because he makes it um, such a struggle for the radical Republicans on the civil rights issues and issues of citizenship and that legislation. Well, they're, they're, they're in there. Now, I should have mentioned um, <laughs> the in, into, the, uh, into the chasm uh, quote. That's something that Stockton, Commodore Stockton said a couple of times while he was um, in the peace convention saying, why don't we have a, a courteous um, and he was referring to a mythological Roman who, when the Roman Empire was falling apart, both in terms of its power, but also physically, they had an earthquake, they had a huge, huge uh, chasm from the earthquake, they were trying to fill it in, they couldn't fill it in, they conferred with an oracle, and the oracle said, well, you're going to have to sacrifice what's most important to you. And no one could figure out what the oracle was talking about. But this fellow, Curtius, who was a military guy, he realized that the, most, the thing that was most um, important, most valuable to Rome was its army. So he suited up in his, in his armor and his, his decorations that he had gotten in battle and all of that. He gets on his horse and he takes his horse and they leap into the chasm. And the chasm closes over him and Rome is saved. So, Interesting. a bit of a romantic, uh, <laughs> looking to, to be that courteous, um, and looking to, to save the union. Well, we do have one final question, so this will wrap things up. Um, was John Potter's opposition to the 14th Amendment because of the way that he was raised by his father? Well, I would, I would say, just as with his father, his, he is a Potter, right? Um, his mother's side of the family was very important. Uh, and I don't have any records in terms of time that John Potter Stockton spent in Georgia visiting the plantation, but certainly he knew the importance of it to his family. By the time his uncle James, um, who was involved in the Thomas Sims controversy, by the time he would die, um, his, his plantation and slaves' personal property was um, about a half a million dollars at that time. Um, so there was a lot of family wealth that was um, tied up in those Southern plantations. Um, we do know that John Potter married a young Jewish woman from New Orleans, Sarah. We, we've talked about that. Um, and so the question just popped. And this is, again, the last question. Um, any information how she fits into the story of John Potter? Well, we know that she influenced his, um, his life in some way. You, know, you, can, you can point to you know, circumstantial evidence going in both directions. And that's why you know, personal letters or whatever it may be may, would help to sh shed more light on that. He, he also was um, a lawyer. Um, and, you know, in terms of opposition to Lincoln and opposition to Republican uh, legislation, um, he did see it. Um, and there was, there was a valid argument that it was overreach. I mean, remember Lincoln um, also suspended habeas corpus. Uh, he bent the constitution arguably in order to save it. Um, so his opposition may have been, which what, what he was, what was his love was um, the law and may have been based strictly on uh, legal grounds, not necessarily his own personal um, family interests. Great point. Yeah, he was a very, uh, we would call him a workaholic today, but he was definitely um, nose to the grindstone. Well, thank you again, John. This was fascinating. And um, we, will, we will all now look at Juneteenth and how it became a national holiday differently. And um, if there are any other questions, you can always email me. I'm 
Deborah Lampert Rudman, the Curator of Education and Public Programs at Morvin. Be sure to tune in for our next Morvin Moments later this month. Uh, we're going to cover um, so interesting points about how and why we think uh, Richard Stockton was led to want to go out of his house, out of Morvin, and go sign the Declaration of Independence. We're going to talk about the things that were swirling in his life to get him there and also talk about our 4th of July celebration this year. So stay tuned for Morvin Moments. And again, thank you so much to John and everyone. Have a good evening. You're welcome. And thank you to you all. Okay. Take care.